And I remember also in, in Seventh Dreams, I remember the, uh, the assisted suicide scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. That uh, I'm still shaken by the scene, but it's partly because the words and the way the dialogue was placed was, it wasn't the, the stream of communication, it was something else. There was, and no, there was, there was no dialogue at all, actually. See, there it you go. But it, there was uh, people would mutter things among themselves, but the music was so loud that you... Right. Well, the music was so loud, the music wasn't that loud, but I mean, there was ambient music that yeah. was playing that there was no way people could actually decipher what, what uh, was, was being told, and they were actually, everything was under, underplayed. And so is there a relationship then, because visually it seems to me, you work on big stages, I see a lot, but I see, when I see a big piece, you frame individual things either with a constructed frame or with a light or within a camera. And do you, f you frame words the same way? You place words, are usual theatrical communication, you place them in a context, mm -hmm. like the stethoscope or like the music. Mm -hmm. So you're framing both image and mm -hmm. sound. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I like all devices that are around that allow me to get that little thing. I mean, there's a quality of, if you're gonna speak on a cell phone to someone, is something very, 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 very intimate or very important or that you don't want other people to hear and you'll just say that here on the cell phone. And you have this room of people partying, let's say, there's this huge noise. I'm interested in what's going on here. So on stage, I'll try to recreate all this noise and all this stuff, and I'll have somebody open the cell phone and say something, you know, so is it, you know, if it's cancer or not. You know, and, and, <clears throat> and that, I think, has a value. There's a, there's a counterpoint there that is more symphonic, more operatic, even if it's uh, whispered in a small cell phone. Uh, there's something lyrical about that, that I think theater has lost, because I think theater was, uh, was more operatic before. There was something about how actors used voices. There was, uh, people sang, people are a bit too televisual today on stage. Uh, they, they, they're, they're, uh, there's something about realism, the way they use realism, uh, and the way they use their voices in that realism doesn't interest me. Let's go to something specific then. Is, is, uh, well, I'm doing Antigone now, which is from the Sophocles, yeah. but I'm doing the Ennui. And uh, an Anglo Saxon Canadian wrote, oh, here's a speech this long from Creon. Oh, here's a speech this yeah. long. And then uh, Sean at Stratford, who's doing Fedra, says, yeah, they're, they're tirades. Yeah. You know, it's French. You go. And I said, well, should there be a psychological reason why I go on? No, no, you go. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing now is it is the sound yeah. of that page and a half from Creon as much as the content. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Absolutely. And, I mean, the thing is, I, I had the, the opportunity to direct uh, people at the, the Royal National Theatre in London and some major theatre artists in uh, Barcelona and, and, and Madrid, directing them in Spanish, and also I worked at the Tokyo Globe doing Shakespeare in Japanese. Okay, and how how these different cultures use language and the voice, and and the uh, uh, the syncopation, the musicality of the delivery has nothing to do. And we're working on the same text. Spaniards just kind of just, you can't stop them and say, well, wait a minute, you have to stress that word, or that's the important word. And they just kind of vomited to you, and it's, and it's this long flow of energy that actually carries the meaning. I guess that's proper to the Spanish language. At times they will sculpt it, but in general it's this rush of passionate words that just comes out and, and the speed and this energy. But in England, I remember how <coughs> uh, actors uh, would, would, the way they use words and, and, and each little syllable, and, and, and also because the English language is a language that's completely Compressed. I mean, French Canadians. Uh, uh, you know, when they say, uh, "I want to, I want to hold your N," and you want to say, "No, it's hand." There's an H there. It's not an. It's an A, not an N. And there's a D at the end. So you, you in English, you use. Unless you're talking in Brooklyn, I want to hold the N. What are you the fuck yeah. are you talking about, man? Yeah. Come on, Robert. I want to hold the N. It's still. You know, it's the. Still, you, you, you still you, you use letters in a single little in one syllable. The letters are used as if they were syllables, right? Yeah. Uh, French, we, we abandon syllables and finals and all of that. We, there's tons of what's written. The, the letters that you see written on, on the page, half of them are not pronounced. You know, 
are just like some leftover stuff from the past, and you don't just don't pronounce it. But in English, it's this very, uh, very, very good actors use a scalpel and they make the the H of hand sound like an H, and the D hand the king. And I'm exaggerating, but what I mean is that you you hear that a good actor in Stratford says the king. You know, <laughs> listen carefully. So that's uh, the English way of approaching it, and it's it has all of its qualities and all that. That's fine. and German, but you can't German also. But even German, uh, Germans invented the the Sprechgesang, which is the the way they use they they're used to making things sound strange, right? The okay. whole thing about Brecht is uh, uh, defect. I'm not pronouncing it well. But it means the, the effect of making something feel strange, thus making it interesting. So you recreate life on stage, but it has to look strange. So suddenly it becomes interesting. So people should speak in a different manner. So the whole Sprechgesang of the, the Bresch songs, uh, that he, what he did with Kurt Weill, these amazing... Ah, 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 ah. So this, this half-spoken, half-sung. Um, a lot of Germans still today use the language um, in a song way, or they 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 they, they put they, they stress syllables that are not supposed to be stressed and all that, and they create this kind of strange delivery that makes it fascinating and interesting and, and crafty and artistic. But to go back to the English, then who yeah. who parse, who use, who use the G and the K like tools? Uh, how do you deal with it then? Because your mother language is French, and yeah, it's yeah. and it's all based on something completely different. Even so, so tell me a bit about French as well, because yeah. the, I want to talk about Antigone as well, because the script we're using is a French play, it's ennui, okay. Yeah, yeah. But then it was anglified through uh, mm -hmm. an American whatever, yeah. but the director, Chris Abram, in this, in this case, has tried to go back to the original French and say, well, let's go to the French. No, 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 hear it. And I would say in rehearsal, but the, the, the impetus, the flame under the original language in French is very different. It's a flame. Yeah. Whereas in English, uh, there's a structure and they use structure. Yeah. So how do I, as, an, as a mm -hmm. can I, so I speak English, how do I uh, take from ennui the, mm -hmm. the flame and keep it alive in English, which is structure? Yeah. Help. Well, it depends also, because you're, you're referring to a text by ennui who, that is a very literary Antigone. Is Antigone is, is not is not the same uh, as the Greek one. It's it's very it's very florist. It's just something to be read, right? So I mean that, that's the thing. I mean there's, there's also schools of thoughts around uh, this adaptation of, of Antigone. But a, a lot of the 20th century French adaptations or or, or uh, plays uh, are made to be both read and said. So there's a there's a literary when you when you, you you do French text in the 20th century, there's something that's very literary that you have to take into account. So you have to convey to the audience the brilliance of the writing on the page, as the acting. Mm -hmm. So it, there's, there's always a double level of acting there. Um, it, it's a bit the equivalent. Uh, and this is a good comparison, but you know when when you do Hamlet in English and then you do it in French, if you do uh, if you do list list or list. And, and you do that in French, there's no word in French that, in, in, the, in that monologue that will make it sound with all the S's, of, of, yeah. uh, which is the sound of the serpent that poisoned the father, which is the sound that you do in the ear. It's all about the ear and, this, you know, and, the, and the, the whistling and the, and the hissing. and All of the speech is built on the sound of the English language. Right? You can't do that in French. So you have to rely on something else. You have to find within... The translation, whether the translation is, the the um, the play on sounds that will remind you of a snake, that will remind you of hissing, that will remind you, of, but you you're certainly going to stress the same words. But the root, uh, so the language, the the voice, the language that comes out, the root in Spanish, as you say, it's mm -hmm. wow, out it comes. Yeah. The can you describe the root of French language? And Quebec, because mm -hmm. Quebec's a little different. Yeah. And what you see, which is useful to us, is the root of English, because you're an outsider looking at yeah. English, but you know English. What, what is the root of French? Well, it, I mean, the root of French is partly the root of English, because English, if you've read Shakespeare, half of the English language is French. French. Not just borrowed, but mispronounced, misspelled. You know, it's all of that. That's 
So it was shocking for these people to hear that, but you know, if you read Shakespeare, my God, there's, there's French words there that we don't even use anymore in you know, pursuing French. But uh, uh, so. Uh, but I mean the emotional root, mm -hmm. right? The impetus to talk. Yeah. Well, I think that that's why the the uh, uh, th there's something about the length of the French language. There's something that happens in the length. Uh, we work with Alexandrin, which is a 12 beat thing. That's a natural, tragical form that uh, people like Racine used and Corneille and all these people to, to, to because it, you take the time to, it's all about argument and how that argument, you go to the end of your thoughts and it takes 12 beat. Shakespeare takes 10 most of the time, I think. It takes 10 all the time, yeah. pretty much. So, so it says a lot about how the French always over explain things and how they over intellectualize. Things Why? How they Why do they over? It's, I guess it's the, it's, it's the way the culture, it's the history of the culture, it's the convergence of all these, these um, uh, different uh, other cultures that, that form the, the French language and, and the influence of Germany because of course uh, uh, even though France and Germany have been, a, been through two great wars, uh, they're very, very connected culturally. They, they're, they're very kin on a lot of things and the French language is Germanizing itself. <clears throat> by taking hyphens out and things, and it's starting to be very, not German in the sense it doesn't sound like German, but it's starting to adopt rules that uh, you find in the German language. The French, all the new academics are uh, squeezing the French language together and, and welding it like they do in Germany. And uh, so, so, but that's probably all, all connected to social politics. And, and right. Like that. But um, so um, the French language is uh, to understand the French language and what it's about. What you see on the page is not what you hear, which is the contrary of any other language. Spanish, what you, it is spelled, what you hear, you write it down, and you, chances are there's no misspelling because there's no extra letter, there's no exceptions, there's no... Um, the French language is one of the most unfriendly, it's, it's the unfriendliest language to learn for a lot of people because it has so many exceptions. It's all about exceptions. It says a lot about the French because the French think that they can do this, but of course that, that's an exception, or we could do this, or we could do it. <laughs> it says a lot about the French, but, uh, so, and a lot of what you read are just symbols and things that you don't even pronounce, you don't even need to pronounce. The sound O can be spelled, with an O can be spelled A-U, can be spelled E-A-U, E-A-U-L, E-O-A-L-T, E-A-U-X, O, uh, A, U, X, etc., etc. It could be with a, with a little hat on it. It could be. There's like 10, 12 m fashions of uh, writing O, and you don't even change how you say it. Right? So it's something that's happening in the book, on the page, the French language. It's not just something that's happening. Uh, it's not just something that, 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 that's, that comes to the ear. So you're saying the oral tradition is not connected to the written tradition as much as in English well, or German or Spanish. What I'm saying is that to understand the French culture is that it's visual, it's sense of, of, of uh, the language is a visual thing as much as it is a, a, an auditive thing. And um, when, when I started working in, in England, I had to um, uh, train myself to not say the, the spectators, I had to say, oh yeah, the audience. But in the Latin world, we say spectators, people who come to see a play. In the Anglo-Saxon world, you see the audience, people come to listen to something. That's not just a play on words, it means something about those two societies, about those two cultures. That there is something that is all about the ears and the sound in the Anglo-Saxon world. And in the Latin, French, Spanish world, uh, it's, uh, it's a very, there's something that's very visual about uh, and that you, that, that finds traces in, as I say, when, when, you, when you read a French text, uh, you have to see the 12 beats on the paper. You have to, you, you know that um, this person <coughs> said, uh, let's say, um, I'm looking for a word that's spelled differently. Um, okay, if you, if you say, for example, uh, red, red, which means stiff, R-A-I-D-E, in the old French was written R-O-I-D-E, but you still pronounce it red and not roide. But it rhymes with froid, which means cold. 
So when you say froid, you say, oh, he said red, but we have to think that in the old French it was what, so then it's a rhyme. So that's the, that's the French language. It's full of these things that are happening. Right. As you're, what you hear is one thing, but you always have to refer to what it looks on the page. Right. The closest I've found to that is the Japanese language, because the Japanese language is it's, it's the best of both worlds. It's uh, the way they write it yeah. down. It's because what we write down, whether it's French or English, most of what we write down is, it's like a musical score. We, we write the sounds, right? <clears throat> so you will read, I, I will write the words, read this word. But in Japanese, you will have an image, a picture of the word. The word, word, is a picture, it's a drawing, right? It's a Chinese character that's been borrowed, and it's, it's called kanji. That's an object. It's a picture. But a visual stimulus. Okay. And there's no letters, no nothing. It's, mm. just, it's just one picture. And then there's another picture, which, which is a picture that is for read. There will be a picture there. Read word. But between, there'll be little sounds, little symbols that indicate how to say the words that go between. So it's like a, when you work with film, um, like celluloid, you have all these little images, but mm. you also have the sound mm -hmm. with it. So that's the, the Japanese language is always a, a bra it always braids both image and sound. And you're always, so to learn Japanese, you have to. And you're saying the French is a little like that, it's that as little, you speak it, it you, you are aware of the structure on the page. I think so. I so in English, I would say, you know, we're, we're taught or, you know, observe the end, especially in Shakespeare, observe the end of every line, observe the caesura. So that's partly keeping a structure and TV, TV talk is like, well, I don't know, you want to, yeah, yeah. is devoid of structure in English, but mm -hmm. to actually make it work on stage, we do have to slightly observe structure Absolutely. from the page to make the meaning land. Absolutely, yeah, but you need the structure to make the meaning uh, but, but as I say, it's, it, actors go through a different process as they do in French or they do in Spanish or in Italian, which is all about which word you stress, which syllable you stress, which, yep. uh, and in the case of Japanese, um, a lot is that very, very last syllable which determines uh, the meaning of the whole sentence, right? So uh, they have different little particles that they put at the end, so very often the the line just goes through right. without no intention, but at that very last thing, they strike this little bell and go, oh, they're saying this, okay, that's what they mean. So, you know, actors use language, and, and I'm interested in that. I'm not good yeah. at any of these, but I'm interested in that phenomenon, how people use language and how they use uh, the voice and how they use...